Um, the meeting uh, is packed today, and so I'm going to go ahead and honor your time and get started with our meeting. Uh, happy Friday, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. I am Sherry Hartman, and I'm with the Carilion Clinic and Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine in Roanoke, Virginia. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of our Virginia ED Bridge Replication Project. Um, as you can see in the opening slide here, uh, this project is jointly sponsored by the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance Services, a number of DMAS staff are on here, and also the Virginia Department of Health. And I think we have Liz and others joining us uh, from the Department of Health, um, together with the Carilion Clinic, which serves most of Southwest Virginia. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to have you join us today. Um, what we're gonna do is start with just some instructions from someone I want to express my deepest gratitude to, and that's Christine Bethune with DMAS, who has helped to set up this meeting for us today um, and has been uh, so helpful and patient in making all of this possible. So thank you so much, Christine. I'll let you do your instructions piece, and then I'll do an overview of today's agenda. Great, thank you, Dr. Hartman. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, during this meeting, we do have a closed captioning service. So thank you so much to the captioner who's on our call. If you use the link in the chat box I just put, um, you can have access to that service. It, and it'll pop up an extra window, so you'll want to kind of um, make a window side by side so you can see the slides as well as the captioning service. And we are using WebEx today, and a lot of folks might not be used to this platform, but um, during this meeting, we have an open meeting concept, so you are able to unmute and mute yourself throughout this meeting um, so that you can ask questions or comments as well. And just to know when you're muted or not muted, if you see the red microphone, phone icon if you are muted and the green means you are unmuted. And um, that's it, Dr. Hartman. So I'm gonna share it, send it back to you. Very good, uh, Christine, thanks so much. That's so nice and clear, I love that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have hit record, right, Christine? And so we are uh, recording this session just to let you know that. Um, and also, um, not just so that you realize it's being recorded, but that um, it's going to be available, made available to you. Thank you to Christine. She is going to send out the link to this recording. Uh, we'll probably need the couple of days for uh, DMAS to be able to make it available, um, but that will be shared with you. And then Christine, it'll also be posted on the DMAS website under the Support Act section. Yes, so the email will go up onto our website and I will um, email out that link so you can access it. And then I'll post the slides as well. And, uh, and that's not actually Ashley Harrell, it's Christine Bethune. <laughs> but we, we have another, the real Ashley Harrell <laughs> joining us today. Um, so as you can see on the agenda, she will follow me after the overview and you'll hear from Ashley Harrell who is the Art Senior Program Advisor at DMAS. Um, so just by way of overview, this is our first effort to pull together the learning collaborative of our ED Bridge early implementers and prospective implementers of this model. Um, so, you know, we look forward to today, um, not starting from scratch about the ED Bridge because most everyone on the call is already well into the process of exploring what's involved in starting an ED bridge. But this is a chance to share what kinds of challenges you've been facing in trying to roll out the model, uh, questions that you might have can be asked, and, uh, and also please feel free to share any successes that you might have experienced with your ED bridge. Um, so this is a chance to tap into the shared expertise on this call, and that includes all of you. Every one of you um, can share your experiences, and please feel free to do that. As Christine said, this is an open format, and I do invite you to unmute yourself and to join the conversation. Some of that shared expertise includes 
uh, Ashley Harrell, who will follow me, and also Dr. John Burton, um, who is chair of emergency medicine at Carilion Clinic. He's the originator of our Carilion ED Bridge program, wonderful champion of the ED Bridge, and he's he's just been invaluable, I know, in responding to some of the questions that you all have, have already posed for us. Um, so this will be a chance to get further input, input from Dr. John Burton. And I also have with me uh, Dr. David Hartman, uh, we are married. We work together in the office-based opioid treatment program here at Carilion, and uh, he has a length of experience in prescribing buprenorphine and uh, is available to answer questions about buprenorphine. Um, we also will put a special spotlight on the virtual bridge model at the Virginia Commonwealth University, and uh, we'll have a presentation by Drs. Brandon Wills and Dr. Jerry Moeller. Um, and we are honored to have um, on our call today, Dr. Patty Juliana. Um, I uh, worked with SAMHSA for many years and always appreciated their support and their resources. Dr. Juliana is the director of the Division of Pharmacologic Therapies with the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. And we sure appreciate your being available today. Uh, a number of questions have come up about uh, submitting the application, the notice of intent to SAMHSA, and Dr. Juliana has put together a really clear, wonderful PowerPoint. So uh, please be sure not to miss that part at the end of the meeting today. And we'll plan to conclude at one o'clock. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Harrell. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hartman and everyone, uh, Dr. Burton for um, both of you for developing and facilitating the ED Bridge Learning Collaborative for the participants today, um, as well as the lives that are positively impacted by your work um, and the compassion of your team at Carilion. And also want to give a shout out to Dr. Moeller and Dr. Wills. Um, and I see their team with BCU are on, Katie and Tracy, um, with their virtual bridge uh, model that both of your teams have employed over the years. And I just have to share with you the stories um, of the experiences of your patients uh, and their families and the impact that these efforts have made in their lives is significant and most importantly, um, is life-saving. Um, so again, just wanted to a special thank you for our attendees today and congratulations on being chosen to participate in this ED Bridge Learning Collaborative. Um, and as uh, Dr. Hartman mentioned, we are deeming you the Virginia early implementers. Um, and we know that these are difficult times uh, for health systems and you have many uh, competing priorities. And so I just wanna thank you for your interest and your willingness to be part of this collaborative. Um, and also to let you know that Virginia Medicaid is dedicated um, and very interested in supporting the expansion of the DD Bridge uh, clinics throughout the state. And we're working with stakeholders um, and also seeking additional funding options uh, to help support expanding this model. Uh, so thank you again. And now I'll pass it over to the various doctors that are going to be uh, kicking this off and sharing uh, their expertise um, and how you can leverage this model within your health system. Dr. Hartman. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and uh, Christine's going to advance our slides for us. All right, so we'll, oh, here we go. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is um, at least point out the folks who've been involved. And uh, I don't think we'll have time for each of you to unmute and introduce yourselves. I wish we could. But as we go through it um, and you have a question, be sure to identify yourself. And also, if you want to share information with each other, use the chat box um, and we certainly welcome, welcome that. Um, what I'm going to do at this point is actually have Christine um, stop sharing the PowerPoint so we can see each other. And as I call out your hospital, if you would, um, you know, put up a reaction, what do they call it on WebEx? Raise your hand <laughs> um, in order for us to see who you are. Um, so I, I already mentioned Dr. John Burton, 
who was the originator of the Carillion Roanoke Memorial EV Bridge. And uh, Dr. Burton, you will hear from later. Also, I've mentioned the Virginia Commonwealth uh, University EV Bridge, the virtual model. Um, we have with us several folks from there. If you want to raise your hand and identify yourselves, you could do that or even hit the, the button. Uh, thanks, folks, for being here. Um, we also have some sister Carillion programs that Dr. Burton has inspired and trained to get up and running. Um, and these include the Carillion Taswell Community Hospital Program, which is just newly up and running uh, in partnership with New Day Recovery. And uh, we have other sister programs, the Pace to Recovery Program at Carillion Franklin Memorial Hospital. I don't know if any of these folks uh, were able to join us today. If so, feel free to um, hit that raise hand button or raise your hand literally. Um, and we also have another one. Do we have? Oh, yes. New River Valley has a program up and running as well. Dr. Burton, is that right? So, um, I think I see Monica Flores hand up. She was instrumental in making the program at Franklin Memorial Hospital successful. Monica is with the community services board with Piedmont. And a great go to resource. So I want you all to see, you know, this goes beyond what Carillion can offer you. You know, we have this wealth of resources that we can turn to to move ahead with the ED bridge replication project. Um, so those uh, courageous, remarkable folks who are prospective hospitals to start ED bridges include Centera Careplex. Um, if you could raise your hand or give a wave if you're with Sentara. Uh, we've had a number of folks from there, from uh, Sentara Careplex in Hampton and Sentara Norfolk General Hospital. Also, Valley Health Winchester Medical Center. I saw Summer Gerald's on earlier. We're really excited that you're on the cusp of getting yours up and running. Fair Oaks Hospital run by Innova in Fairfax is another one of our sites. And Riverside, they hope to have their startup site at Doctors Hospital in Williamsburg. Thanks for joining us. I see Cynthia Williams and Bon Secours with Clean Slate Centers. Dr. Popovich is on, he's been instrumental in that. Uh, Susan Schotter, I see your hand up. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and, and most, you know, mostly I want to express my gratitude for you being willing to embark on this project. This has been a really challenging time in the life of hospitals uh, during the pandemic. And we've been really impressed that you all have stepped up to the plate um, to initiate ED Bridges. I also want to introduce to you, and we'll go back to the PowerPoint, Christine, just to make sure that you know, besides the persons who are most helpful, we, we have developed some resources to make them available to you. And that includes a training toolkit. Um, I designed this uh, to be, there we go. Um, it's, a, it's a PowerPoint that's interactive. You're able to, as you play the slideshow, click on the links. They are active links that through click and play might bring to you, for example, a video featuring Dr. John Burton with his getting to yes uh, segment, about a 10 minute segment and it's full length um, that you could play at a meeting that could be helpful to you. So you could have Dr. John Burton in your back pocket, just click and play and there he is. Um, there's a number of items. If you could go to the next slide, Christine, I introduce and highlight some of these aspects of the interactive PowerPoint. Um, we have on there the easy one page, we call it in a nutshell page for ED Docs. It's a protocol overview um, in Appendix A1. Um, and on the slide set, it's a uh, slide 62. Um, it's a great go to. We're actually going to share that with you today. Um, we, as I mentioned, have the getting to yes video. We have the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria there, but we also have a click and play link where you can see like Dr. Gail D'Onofrio doing the clinical interview, um, assessing the DSM-5 and making a, a diagnosis. Also in there, 
Um, in the appendix is the CALS, the clinical opioid with withdrawal scale by Wesson and Ling. Um, so the, the idea was to try to give you literally a toolkit that would be user friendly um, and accessible to be helpful to you. There's ready made brochures you can reprint, one on home inductions, another on the locks on education that can go home with patients. And there are clicks like the one we have here um, that takes you to a two hour overview um, that features Dr. David Hartman here over my shoulder. Um, it's an overview on medications for opioid use disorders that was designed to meet the requirement of the Virginia Board of Medicine to complete a two hour training on opioid prescribing of anyone who, who in fact prescribes opioids in Virginia. Um, the, the recording will be live for a long time, perpetuity, I guess, but access to the CME credit um, will expire on the 23rd of March. Um, our CME office was willing to archive it, which was an uh, unusual step for them to make this happen. Um, so they are providing CME uh, credit through March 22nd. If, if you wanna share that link uh, with any, it would be appropriate for physicians, you know, any ACPs, as well as nurses. I think a number of uh, folks tend to overlook the fact that the nurses especially would benefit from this training as well. Um, Christine, next slide. Um, so the um, one thing I wanted to mention is that I am editing this toolkit. And so feel free to provide suggestions to me, additions, uh, some of the feedback I've gotten is to make it more user friendly. It's based on the lessons learned from a quality improvement study that we did. And uh, so there, there's a lot of narrative in there that we could probably cut out. Um, and also I might try to um, set up um, a, a format whereby we will indicate in a kind of overview at the beginning, a guide that if you are an ED doctor, these are the most relevant resources. If you are, um, you know, an outpatient program, these are your most relevant resources so that you would get even um, more user friendly kind of user's guide to navigate through that document. It is a bit daunting to look at A to Z lessons learned. So uh, we're continuing to try to improve on that and are open to your feedback about how to do that. I wanted to mention, um, you know, the folks who are available as resources, as I mentioned earlier, and you briefly met Monica Flora. Um, she did create the Pace to Recovery Partnership, working together with Dr. John Burton, um, and has wonderful resources. For example, a sample partner agreement template that was established between Piedmont and the emergency departments, the hospital systems. So. Key takeaway here is to look to your local community services board. They're likely, for example, to have more than one level of care that matches the patient's needs, ranging from outpatient to IOP to partial hospitalization and uh, residential programs. They're likely to have peer supports that could potentially be embedded in the ED. We do find peers to be very effective at supporting transitions in care. Um, the CSBs have a number of them have worked out a workflow providing rapid access to treatment, a key element of a successful bridge. Um, other comprehensive services are often provided. Also, um, Marcy Rosenbaum would want me to say, look to your federally qualified health centers with their OBOTs. Um, be on the lookout for echo trainings that are provided. Uh, we just recently did one on converting from an OBOT to an OBAT. Um, so these are resources I just wanted to highlight today and we'll go on. Christine, I wanna turn this over as quickly as possible to Dr. John Burton. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he originated the Carillion Roanoke Memorial Hospital ED Bridge. Um, and we've captured in this appendix A1 from the toolkit, the ED protocol that Dr. Burton developed and Dr. Burton, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If there's anything you wanna highlight from this, and if you wanna invite comments from our participants. 
Thank you, Sherry. Uh, yes, hi, I'm John Burton, Chair for the Department of Emergency Medicine at Curling Clinic. I also work as our medical director for patient advocacy and risk management. So, of course, today we'll be talking about uh, the bridge components here and availability to you for any questions you might have or dilemmas you want to kick around that we could discuss amongst the group. I do want to start by uh, saying that the last 10 years have been particularly difficult uh, for the pan uh, for those of us uh, doing healthcare in pandemic on the pandemic, and I'm really grateful for everyone's work. Um, particularly in emergency medicine, mental health services, uh, it's been a real challenge for us on the front lines uh, through two years of navigating that and trying to stay on the same team instead of battling against one another. Uh, I also recently had the opportunity to uh, co-manage a, a patient of interest with um, Dr. Wills over at uh, VCU, and, and that experience once again brought into my attention how fantastic the Department of Emergency Medicine is over at VCU and, and they're really talented providers. So big thank you to Dr. Wills and of course, Dr. Moeller, who's also on the call here. Uh, I think the two big questions that always come up to me uh, when I'm talking to any groups um, are number one, how do you get started? So how so can you reflect a little bit on how you get started and, and what are options? Uh, in doing that, and then number two, what are how do you keep everybody on the same page in terms of running the protocol? So let me go after the first question, which is uh, how do you get started? We looked at a number of options, and at the time, as we were getting ready to start our bridge program, uh, with the key component, of course, was identifying the OBOT partner. So that's uh, we felt like we just could not start until we had an OBOT partner, and that's the way we've been with all of our uh, six emergency departments um, as we roll out programs. And so then once we did that, then, of course, the challenging work for us internally was how are we actually going to train our providers, get them onto a single protocol, and how that's going to work. Uh, we had no funding at the, at the time initially for our providers, so what we uh, ultimately did was we asked our leaders in our clinical operations group, myself as the chair, our medical directors. Uh, we made a pitch to them about why this was important, what an opportunity it was, the big scale of, of the problem that we have nationally and in the Commonwealth with opioid use disorder as well as accessibility to programs to help those individuals get into recovery programs and treatment. And, uh, and so that was pretty much preaching to the choir. So then what we did was we got the choir to then get wavered and then start prescribing uh, on, in, on the ED side for the leadership. We then had those individuals take call for our six emergency departments 24 hours a day. Um, and that really came down to myself and our, our vice chair of emergency medicine, who was very active in uh, addiction services, Michael Donato, that we were taking call as we were waiting for other people to see the light and get the waiver. Um, because in our six EDs, we've got 72 physicians rotating through. Uh, so it was really going to be quite a lift for us to do that, do it that way. But again, that's the tactic that we took. So we had about three months where uh, a lot of calls would come to myself or Dr. Donato. We really didn't have many at the night because you could boot those into the morning um, uh, with holding a, a patient over. And also we didn't have a lot of those patients coming in in the middle of the night that we felt were good candidates initially. And then after about three months, a number of our physicians came on board. And of course, during that three month period, we were singing the successes of the program both in the emergency department and crossing the bridge over to our OBOT partner with uh, David Hartman and Sherry Hartman and their teams, including Bill Ray and the Department of Psychiatry and Addiction Services for Carillion. So we, we really were uh, maybe not bombarding people with daily messages, but certainly a weekly message talking about how the program was going and, and getting the ball rolling down the hill, if you can uh, envision that. That then brought about another third of the, of the group into the waiver. Um, and then after getting that third going, after about a, a three months, we were able to show uh, to our organization and senior administration the potential for the program and how things, how well things were going. 
And we were allowed to then put some scorecard funding, which is kind of like a citizenship um, uh, dollars at risk in our physician pool. And we do that every year for physicians practicing at Carilion Clinic. And um, it's a it's not a lot of money, uh, but it's enough to get your attention. Uh, hey, if, if there's a quarter on the street, I'll bend down and pick it up, right? So on the other hand, but it, it you know may take a few dollars to get me motivated to go out and fill out the paperwork and do the training. The other thing that happened was we uh, were able to the uh, nationally the training requirement dropped. Uh, so that allowed to further reduce the challenge that physicians in our group had of spending that time to get the waiver. And of course, we submitted them administratively as much as we could in, in submitting paperwork. Uh, so through that scorecard initiative, it allowed us to bring a few dollars into it so that we could further incentivize those physicians. And then that got us uh, on the order pretty quickly in the next three months at the end of about total of six, seven, eight months got us to a position where we had about 75% of our physicians who were um, uh, who were wavered and then practicing. And given that um, we also were picking up some of our physician assistants and nurse practitioners as well, that then ended up getting, getting us pretty near complete coverage across all six emergency departments. And certainly any department where we had double coverage or our level one trauma center where we have quadruple coverage, that uh, gave us uh, the opportunity to always have someone on site. So that was really the way that we did that. Now, of course, uh, Sherry likes to sing my praises, but then she doesn't tell you about my failures. And one of my failures uh, looking back was we had this great um, uh, this great momentum at, in getting people wavered, and one of the things that I should have done as chair that I have not done, and I and I will change this summer as we onboard some new physicians, is I should have said, okay, now all new physicians coming into the group, we will require them to be wavered. As a new physician or a PA or nurse practitioner coming into an emergency medicine group, you got to fill out all this credentialing and privileging paperwork and, and you know, pull up your ACLS and ATLS and all these other uh, little pieces. So you're, you're picking up all these different training modules and going through all this onboarding. And what we should have done uh, in the, over the last year was make this a required part of our onboarding for our physicians. Now, it turns out we have a very, very stable group in emergency medicine. We only have about 4% turnover for per year, which means we only bring about two uh, providers in each year. So it's not been a huge missed opportunity, but that's something I did fix. One of my inspirations just in thinking about that too, uh, Susan Promes, who is the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine up at Penn State, she and I had a discussion about a year ago and Susan was telling me how they had just made this required onboarding for their PAs, nurse practitioners and physicians in their department. So that was uh, pretty much the way we got into the program. And of course, then that means that if you're gonna run it that way where you've got multiple providers, the advantage is you've got 24 seven availability. On the other hand, you gotta keep everybody on the same page. Um, so before I kind of get to the same page, then let's just say, how, did, how could you do it in other ways? Uh, another way that uh, other departments have had, and I know Dr. Wills and Dr. Moeller could talk about their approach too. Um, you could go into a telemedicine route. We didn't have that available to us. Uh, so they're gonna talk at length about that. I'm really excited to hear the details there. And then another thing that we could have done is we could have had a, um, a on-call nurse practitioner or physician assistant, or maybe even a physician or even a ind individual uh, person who would have been in the department during specific hours, maybe five days a week during uh, regular day hours. And then you could have tried to hold on to these patients or defer them or their follow-up information to that individual to have one key individual, a physician or a physician assistant who then kind of sweeps all that up within a couple of hours of it being presented. And that just becomes their 
one of their tasks in the group. So we have seen that model. I know there's a new uh, emergency department in New York. One of our medical students went to where they have a couple of PAs specifically trained and the PA comes on at 8 a.m. in their shift and they try to hold people through the night if they have overnights and then clean and then grab people during the day and refer them uh, out through that dedicated group of a couple of PAs. So that's another option. So in our process, then keeping everybody on the same page, uh, the biggest thing that we do it really is just communicate, communicate, communicate. We, uh, I, I like to say I'm an email manager, which kind of scales scares people, people. But it means that if you're working in a group that I have a leadership position in, you're going to get um, a very um, contemplative number of emails from me. It's not going to be so much that you're just going to delete them because you're exhausted, um, but you're going to get some selected emails. And as often as possible, I'll put financial information in there so that that'll really get your attention or uh, shifts or time or whatever it is. And then, uh, then we try to bring in department updates with, with clinical operations information. And that communication has served us very well throughout the pandemic, actually, because we were always making this up as we were going along with the pandemic. And, and somewhat similarly for the bridge protocol, as we learned how to do it on for our experience on the front lines for emergency medicine, I tried to send out an email each week with case studies uh, or declarations of victories or occasionally declaration of our uh, of our failures and telling people how we needed to make make changes. Um, so I think that was our our biggest component was we use an email platform instead of like a group meeting each month. We use an email platform in our group for our physicians and physician assistants and nurse practitioners to uh, to communicate this kind of operational information. And every chance I got, I would I would try to update people and keep them interested and change that message just a little bit to keep their their interest and get them so they weren't terribly bored as we tried to then make changes. We, of course, did put a protocol book in the ED um, and also sent out uh, attachments that people could drop into their smartphone. I have a couple of dozen attachments I throw into my notes function of my iPhone so that I can pull up stroke protocols and myocardial infarction protocols, uh, which tests we're using, which week uh, around COVID testing, et cetera. And that's one of the things that we did was send out any kind of attachments that people could drop into a notes function or whatever app they use um, uh, with their electronic device at work. And that, so this that's really served us quite well with that structure. So I think those are the two most common questions that I get. If anybody wants to drill down into any specific thing on that, uh, happy to revisit it. Or if there's other questions you'd have for me, uh, then gosh, I'd be happy to take them. Yes, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask Dr. Burton a question um, that might help you resolve a, a, log a logistical issue or just some kind of concern you might have? I'm really awesome. good at asking myself questions as well. well Susan, but, Susan but, Gerald's, um, John, I think Susan Gerald's from Winchester was gonna share what she found useful to learn from an exchange with you. Speaking Wonderful. of your helpful emails. <laughs> uh, Summer, do you wanna share what you learned? Sure. Um, so I definitely had some questions that I had asked before, and Dr. Burton, you were you really promptly went ahead and um, responded to those. These questions were a combination of questions that came about from the the ED medical staff, um, as well as some of the other uh, people that we've been discussing, uh, getting this up and running with the the our core group that that has been discussing this. So one of the things that they had asked was, was there a particular consent to treat um, specific to initiating buprenorphine in the ED? Um, and was it a separate type of consent to treat or just the primary ED consent to treat? Um, which I know that you had responded that it's it's the same one. There's no need to, to have anything different. And you provided literature for us um that you guys typically uh end up giving your patients as part of that uh that ed visit 
Um, they had asked if a patient at your location, one of the things that, that we have that is a bit of a struggle is that we have, I'm going to go as far as to say zero substance use services within our, uh, our mm -hmm. health system here. Um, the, the closest thing we have to it is our, our expert program that um, we have here as well as the our ability to do counseling within that expert program. So what the deal was, was they were asking whether or not a patient comes into the ED for subsequent dosing. Since we don't have anything here on site um, or whether or not there are, uh, there's a prescription that's handed to a patient or something along those lines that they can walk out the door with. Um, and you had shared that there are several days worth of prescriptions that can be given um, that can be given at that first ED visit. Um, I had asked if ED physicians need to be waivered still, or if some piece of that had been kind of scaled back during the pandemic. Um, and you had said that they still need to be waivered. Um, and then I had asked for any kind of quick handouts or anything like that that you were able to provide, and you did provide some some wonderful attachments that I was able to forward on to our uh, ED medical staff and the rest of our team as well. Yeah, thanks so much, Summer. I appreciate you uh, going through those components. Um, those are really common questions. I I'll also again point out another failure. We do have a couple of physicians in our group who are hardwired against doing this program for different reasons. And we've had conversations with them to try to delve into that. And their primary issue, well, the primary issue, not surprisingly, is the recurring issue of why would I treat an addiction with a medication that is, uh, that is similarly, in this case, uh, at least a partial agonist um, and and so they see just swapping out one drug with another and and just that just doesn't make sense to them. And we've tried to have conversations and I would say I've probably won about half of those conversations where I've converted people over um, to it. Uh, on the other hand, we still have a few people that I've not converted over and and at least for now, I've given up on them because it's not critical that I have their participation. Uh, so that's something to contemplate too. If, if when you do launch a, your your program, if you've got a group or then and you anticipate you may have some naysayers, how are you going to deal with them? Are you going to do something administratively or or structurally to to really um, go after them if if the discussion has failed? And and again, fortunately, that's not really been a problem for us because we have a large enough group and we've got enough backup. That we can get it done if uh, if uh, one of those providers is is just not desirous of being in the program. Um, Jerry Muller uh, from VCU had asked a question too of Have we seen much precipitated withdrawal? And I I think the uh, so when you're when you when you have a patient who comes in and you give them a dose of Suboxone in the ED, um, it's well known in the teaching that. There are some some individuals who will go into a precipitated withdrawal uh, from the combination of the um, partial agonist as well as um, the naloxone component antagonist. And what I would say to that is that uh, two components where we have initially when we were using lower doses of suboxone, we were using either the two milligrams of suboxone or four milligrams of our uh, uh, of suboxone as our initial dose, then we were seeing some precipitated withdrawal. I personally did not see any severe, but I I did see people who would who would say, you know, I'm 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 feeling a little worse or I'm feeling a little shaky. And what we had been trained to do, fortunately, by our experts uh, in uh, in our backup, uh, including Dr. Hartman on the on the call here, is and in the training. Uh, for the um, for the waiver was to basically just treat through that. So you go ahead and, and redose. So we would redose people another four milligrams, and then within about thirty minutes they'd be feeling fine. We then quickly pivoted to going to just eight milligrams for nearly everyone. And since I've been using the eight milligram dose of Suboxone as my initial dose, 
I haven't seen any precipitated withdrawal with that. Now, I do have other people in our group who claim that they have seen it. One individual in particular um, has seen uh, some severe cases of withdrawal. And again, I think the common thread there is starting out with lower doses, whereas I'm very comfortable starting out with an eight milligram dose. Um, you know, most of the patients, when you talk to them to in the ED, they've, they've been on it before and on Suboxone and they were previously on eight milligrams twice a day. So it just makes sense to take them right back to that dose. Um, so other than that, we've, we've really not seen much of a challenge with it. Um, we do give people in our program somewhere between three to a seven day supply. I have had uh, individuals I've given as much as 14 day supply, um, but we really like doing three or seven. And then of course, as Sherry pointed out in our protocol um, uh, includes, we, we do check the PMP to make sure that we don't have somebody who's a repetitive player. For the first time this last week, again, another failure, for the first time this last week on a shift, I had a patient who came in who was a, a repeat visitor not once or twice, but multiple times, like seven, eight, nine times in the last um, three months. And that was an individual that I refused him at the door. And I was working a triage shift and said, you know, you can't use this as your primary at a gateway for treatment. And there's evidence here in the record that you're not showing up for your appointments and that you've, you've had that happen repeatedly. There is some question, as there are often is, of people whispering around uh, that believed that this individual too was perhaps uh, coming in for, and diverting uh, the prescriptions. You know, you're gonna you're gonna get that sooner or later. And again, fortunately, we've not had many of these. And in two and a half years of the program, three years of the program, this is the first time I've actually told somebody, no, I'm not prescribing for you until you can show us evidence that you're going to show up. So that's a, you know, how you deal with those individuals is another thing to contemplate as you launch your programs. Um, Cause we, we really don't want to miss people and to fathom the possibility that because we're refusing, they're going to be back out on the street and using again. Um, so, so we really try to lean heavy towards prescribing. And of course, there's other things to consider as well. If the patient's pregnant, uh, that changes your perspective quite a bit too. Um, so yeah, just some other, other thoughts. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. This is uh, Doug Bernstein from Bon Secours Memorial Regional Medical Center with Chris Hi, Kroll. Doug. Hey, nice to see you again. It's been a long time, actually. We used to be on a committee together a long time ago. Um, my question for you is around, the, you mentioned the prescription monitoring program. Yeah. Uh, I'm working with Chris to try to get all of our physicians wavered. We're getting pretty close actually. And um, I've heard a couple different pockets of resistance on this. One of them is concerns about diversion. And I actually did not realize that Narcan had more of a street value than I, than I had realized. So that was interesting to learn. Um, but another thing was the, the concern that, that Prescribing this adds to your sort of quota uh, of opiates on the prescription monitoring program, right? And, and we do get these uh, occasional nasty grams that are like, oh, you know, you you prescribe more than fifteen percent or whatever of your prescriptions were were for opioids, and and so there's this pressure to reduce opioid prescriptions, and now people are saying, wait, you're asking me to prescribe more, so they don't want to do that. And I don't know if there's any push to try and get buprenorphine exempted from that. Um, or how people have dealt with that or how that's come up for you. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, great talking to you again, Doug. Yeah, I have, I have, it's been a couple of years, right? So uh, great, great, you know, thing to, to think about. And I'll try to address that real quickly. Um, so in our department, we have really tightened up our opioid prescribing significantly. And we also have an opioid prescribing monitoring program as the chair of the department monthly, I get a report that has um, every single physician in our group and every single prescription for opioids that they have written, including the identity of the drug and the number of pills on that prescription. 
Um, I send that out to our medical directors. I look at it myself because what we're trying to do is keep everybody on a certain protocol and agreement of who we're going to treat for with opioids in our practice. So that has dramatically brought our, our prescribing down of opioids. It's also brought dramatically down the number of chronic opioid people coming in looking for refills and um, and with chronic problems looking for opioids in the ED. We just don't see much of that anymore because we've made those changes. So that may be why we've not gotten any of, the, any of those reports or gotten into any trouble with that. And I have, a, um, I have not personally in our group seen that happen with anyone that it's tripped them over. Um, I do think that the, the diversion discussion is always something you want to contemplate as well. I've had that discussion even with DEA officers and U.S. attorney uh, individuals. I've worked quite a lot with the DEA and the U.S. attorney's office here in the Commonwealth and even next week in North Carolina um, on some select cases. And, and that's a concern that they have on the law enforcement side. You know, and the way I look at it is I, we don't want to flood. I think we I think we're going to need to uh, wrap up oh, okay. and, and, and right. uh, be able to give uh, our uh, VCU experts a chance to talk. Um, and uh, Dr. Bernstein, I hear your question, you know, specifically about to whether or not there's any effort advocacy to take buprenorphine off of that. I'll look into that. It's a great idea. Uh, that, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, and Dr. Burton, sorry to cut you off. I do want to make Not sure we have time for Dr. Wills and, and Dr. Muller. If we can advance the slides, um, let's hear from these experts and then uh, try to circle back around and give a chance for more questions. So we are going to um, move it on. This is Dr. Wills, Fellowship Director of Medical Toxicology, Associate Professor. Department of Emergency Medicine at the VCU Medical Center, and uh, Dr. Muller, Professor and Division Chair for Addictions, VCU, uh, Director of the VCU Institute for Drug and Alcohol Studies. Um, and Christine, let's go on to their slides and turn the mic over. All right, well, John, I'm sorry that you got cut off. I feel bad, and um, for the sake of time, I'm going to run through this quickly so that there can be more discussion and less me talking at you. But just to introduce our team, so Jerry Moeller, um, uh, Tracy Davis is our nurse practitioner and Katie Ringwood, our um, nurse in addictions and Sharon Crenshaw is our coordinator. So shout out to them. Um, can you move the next slide, please? <clears throat> the, the biggest issue for us in our emergency department, I think with ED initiated buprenorphine was emergency physicians that didn't feel comfortable writing for it because they didn't have assurance of what was going to happen post discharge, what kind of follow up they were going to have. And so that was our number one barrier. Um, next slide. And to try to address that barrier and to get um, treatment initiated sooner, we had this idea, or Jerry really had this idea of initiating um, a bridge clinic using telehealth. And COVID, of all the bad things that it's Created in our lives. The one positive thing has been that um, I think many of us have become more comfortable using telehealth as a modality for um, healthcare visits. And so we wanted to couple this idea of an ED bridge with the telehealth platform to, to create this model. Next slide. And so really the goals was uh, for this program was to identify patients in the ED with opioid use disorder, start buprenorphine if medically indicated as soon as possible. And what we really wanted was rapid follow-up, ideally within 24 hours. And this program was um, funded by DMAS. Next slide. And so the infrastructure to help make this happen is uh, the bridge coordinator that, that coordinates the, um, the follow-up visits. If uh, Tracy is doing um, most of the, the follow-up visits, the telehealth visits, and Jerry and I help out with that as well. And then um, Dr. Muller has an informatics crew that is mining data to just compare outcomes of our bridge patients versus some of our historical cohorts before we implemented this model. Next slide. And we're not going to go through all of our data. We, we're still crunching that data, but um, some of the early findings from this, and we've been up and running for about 11 months now. 
we've had actually close to 400 patients referred. I wasn't sure the exact number, but um, we're in the 350 to 400 range. And um, if they make it across this virtual bridge to um, outpatient follow-up, um, many of those patients are staying in um, treatment longitudinally. Um, they've been doing really well. Next slide. The main issue for us right now in terms of challenges and barriers is about um, about 40% of those referred from the emergency department make it to that telehealth visit. And um, although that number is on the low side, it's a lot higher than the number prior to having any type of a follow-up bridge clinic. It was less than 10% before we implemented this program. And so it is, um, it's good to see that number um, higher, but it's certainly, we could, we could definitely be doing better. And one of the potential reasons for that might be, at least at VCU, is that many of our referrals, or at least the majority of them, are for non-fatal overdoses, which I think is a little different than the Carilion experience that Dr. Burton's had, where often uh, those patients are showing up um, just requesting treatment services. And so they might be kind of past the pre-contemplative phase, where many of our patients um, are, are still very much pre-contemplative. So I'm still encouraged by that number. And then we've had some logistical challenges like patients that don't have working cell phones or registration doesn't get the correct phone number. Um, we've had some resource issues that have made some fo making follow up difficult that we're working through. Um, and next slide. And then we're just going to, uh, like I said, we're going to look at outcomes of patients that uh, use this telehealth bridge clinic versus those that didn't and just try to keep getting better. And so. Um, one of our next steps that we're working on right now is um, trying to offer these services in areas, uh, rural areas specifically, that have essentially no um, addiction medicine presence. And so we're looking right now and uh, um, working with some EDs in the outlying areas to um, to implement this model, especially since telehealth can work particularly well in rural areas um, where the clinician doesn't have to physically be co-located there. And I think that's it for um, for our brief presentation. Um, the main take home is really the last one, which is one of Jerry's uh, maxims, which is um, Sutton's law and really um, trying to provide service where the money is, which um, many, many, many emergency departments um, are a portal of entry for patients with opioid use disorder and certainly um, non fatal overdoses are, are a tremendous opportunity for us to to get patients into treatment. And so I don't know if Jerry, if you would um, have any comments that you wanted to add on or if there was any discussion or if we need to jump right into the next thing, but that was basically the ABC clinic um, in a nutshell. No, I think, I think you did it. You got it, Brandon. <laughs> And I see Dr. Burton uh, made a comment, you know, that, uh, you know, we at Carillion have found that population, especially challenging the, the overdose survivor. Um, and in fact, our 1st year, I think we only had 20% of those get into treatment. Uh, yeah. we, we've upped it to 50% this most, but to get it 40%, you know, is, is wonderfully successful. John said, um, he had two of these on a shift last week and couldn't enroll either one. They both declined and wanted to leave. And so it, it's a most challenging population, right? John? But we can definitely um, get better at that. And that's, we're trying not to pat ourselves on the back too hard because we certainly can do better. And that's what we're working on right now is finding ways to, um, to do better. Yeah, it's a tough population, but at least well, another thing we've gotten better at doing is 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 saying to them, "Will you at least take a prescription of naloxone with you?" <laughs> because it was naloxone that saved your life, and and that's gotten better for us some light. Yeah, it's certainly a process of continual learning and continual improvement, um, and that's why I'm uh, you know offering to bring together the learning collaboratives. Um, we're putting one on the calendar for June 10th um, and try to bring folks together again to share the challenges and lessons learned. Um, one of the things that's come up frequently 
is believe it or not, you know, the devil's in the details, right? So you don't have to do the training anymore to get wavered, but you do have to figure out how to navigate the system for applying, uh, submitting a notice of intent to SAMHSA. And uh, my most frequent question I get is, why isn't this working for me uh, from the physicians who are applying to be exempted from the training um, and, and go ahead and get their waiver? And we have with us Dr. Patty Juliana, who has put together, you know, she said it's just a quick overview, but it sure is a clear overview of how to apply. And so I'd love to turn this over to you, Dr. Juliana, and, uh, we can move forward with the slides, Christine, to her PowerPoint on that. All right, Dr. Juliana, welcome. We're so honored to have you here. And, and it's my pleasure. And to be perfectly honest, this helps me and um, the group in two different ways. One is that we now have the slide presentation, and after this, we're posting it on the SAMHSA website so people can have a step by step guide. Um, uh, so my, my little critter is getting ahead of me, but there are the main issue. What the main thing that delays, um, processing a waiver is how they're completed. So you will see that the system is fairly intuitive. Um, what is counterintuitive is that I, what I need to say. I realize I'm saying this to a, a number of emergency room people, but it's important that people go slowly, slow down when you're doing the application and, and I promise you it will be self-evident. Um, so what happens often is that people end up clicking boxes that trigger something. So we get a, a lot of emergency room physicians that are um, actually applying for a 100 level waiver that they probably don't qualify for. And certainly if somebody hasn't taken the training, they don't qualify for um, a regular 30 or a 100 level. So to expedite the system and, and actually for context, I should tell you that we receive about 100 to 150 applications a day. And then we're approving at about 2000, a rate of about 2000 a month. So there's a lot of coming and going and the, the more clearly it's done from the outset or the more accurately it's done for the outset. Um, the better off um, everybody will be. Uh, so the this is the the first set of the main heads up is make sure all all that somebody needs is their medical license and their own personal DEA registration. So we get a lot of students from states that do not recognize students as um, as as practitioners. So some do, some don't. Um, or some recent grads, um, we get people who apply under someone else's DEA number, and there are about five universities in the country that have um, people applying using a hospital-based or their a university. One one number that people use is a disposal, um, a drug disposal unit. So that's the number that they found. So that's the number they're using. It has to be the person's individual registration, DEA registration. The other common error is people put in their NPI number, not their medical license. We don't know, we can't see it's an NPI number. And so all we know is that we can't find their license. So we do send emails to a person when something is amiss. <clears throat> but often people are putting emails that are credentialing unit emails and they don't necessarily get follow up or they don't put their own phone number they put a hospital generic number, it's almost impossible to get to a person when it's a hospital phone number. So th those, are the, those are the hot topics that are not included in here beyond what you see. Um, we get people applying for multiple waivers in multiple states, you only need one, and, um, and then you're good to go. Uh, the other hotspot, I'm sorry, is on here, your, the DEA registration, the state license, and the address all have to be in the same state. So if they're not, it, it will cause problems. So we could go to the next slide. Sorry, or can I do that? Christine, uh, we'll, yeah. Oh, Christine. Christine, thank you, sorry. All right, so for some reason, I'm having this audio connection thing in my own way, and I can't get rid of it, but um, 
But this is simply what you will see when you go to the the buprenorphine web the site for the application, which is at the top in the top blue bar. Um, you go to that. This is what will pop up. Uh, it's a tiny little circle, but it's very important. Do you work for the U.S. military, VA, or Indian Health Service? The rules in federal service are different. You can have the license doesn't have to be tied to the immediate center in which you work. So. Yes or no is important. Next. Um, check your medical practitioner type. If you check on an NP, you'll, there will be a drop down screen that also comes uh, along and you pick the subtype on that. Um, select your state, select your medical license number. Um, this is where people put in their NPI and the DEA registration number also. Uh, and then all you do is hit submit. You check your waiver eligibility. If anybody wants to demo this for anyone, make up information and you'll at least get to the next screen. But go ahead, Christy, if you would. Okay. So when you fill out that box and um, and click submit, the the blue box on the left is what will pop up. It it. it flags people, if you're qualified for a 100 level, why not apply for that? Um, you have to have board certification in, in addiction medicine or addiction psychiatry. We get board certification documents for pain. We've got them for OBGYN, podiatry, um, doesn't count or you provide medication-assisted treatment in a qualified practice setting. There are a number of emergency room practitioners who actually do also provide um, MAT in a qualified practice setting, but we should just keep going because that won't, that's for the 100 level. It involves training. That's not what you need or want. So you, um, do, not hit, left, you do not hit okay on that? No, you, you, do, you do hit doctor. okay. This is, exactly where one of the points of confusion is you do hit okay it 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 just we can't do anything about it it will so yes you do hit okay just to go to the next screen that's why um it's entered there and that's why even though you're not applying for 100 it will simply pop up but okay whatever you say just keep on going um so it is a point of okay confusion if because then we get all the Patty, you do yes, hit okay if you are okay. Mm -hmm. Even if you're you're an ED doc, you still hit okay. Okay, as in okay, I read it. Let me keep going. <laughs> so, um, okay. yes, it just says if under the if you meet these, because that will then trigger a couple of other screens that are very important if you're applying for a 100. But that it is simply a pop up. It comes quickly, and you just hit okay and keep going. Okay. All right, Christine. Great. So now, so once you're, it says that you're licensed and all that, that's the first step is that you're, um, you are eligible. This is the next step. This is, this is the guts of the matter. There are these two small boxes. It looks bigger than this in real life. Um, but there are there's these two small boxes and you only have one choice for either or for both, either yes or no, I'm board certified in addiction psychiatry or addiction medicine, or or yes or no, I provide MAT. That will trigger the 100 application. In this case, for, for people in the ED without training, it's no or no, 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 no. So then you fill in the information um, at the bottom, the license date, the state medical license, the DEA registration number. You've already entered them once. You, it's better to keep them on hand. Um, and then you hit submit. You can go, Christine. So this is if you're starting at the 100 level. Um, this will, so I'm showing this only because it will pop up. It, it gives you the option of applying at the 100 patient level, but if you're only applying for a 30E, 
you can still hit, although I'm eligible for the 100 level, I only want to apply for a 30E. Um, you can continue. The 30E is the one that has no training. That's what you're looking for. So it looks like if I'm an ED doc, I hit no on the top mm -hmm. click, but yes on the other one, so they can continue to apply for a 30 patient level. No, no, no. Remember, it's no and no for a 30E. So if they're not providing medication assisted treatment, it's no, it's no and no. This is what will pop up if you hit the wrong button. Um, I didn't. To do this in a five minute presentation will cause confusion, but you'll need this if people are going to go to this without the review. So, because they will open the screen and like, what? How did this come up? So it's no and no. Um, um, we found this, this, um, this was the confusion right here. Um, so they are providing MAT in that they are writing prescriptions. They are writing prescriptions. They're not just doing the three day rule. They are writing prescriptions. And so they want to be wavered. And so a, a number of doctors found the only way they could navigate to the level they wanted was by doing no and then yes, and then clicking, um, I wish to only apply for 30 patient level. With exemption, the one they want With is the exemption. one on the bottom. I'm sorry. This. For some reason, the audio connection won't um, box won't is blocking the screen, and so you're right. It is. I'm sorry. Um, it is the bottom one. It's 30 patient level with exemption. It says no training. That's the one they want. Yeah, and I, so they no, and then yes, and then uh, I wish to only apply for 30 patient level. Correct. Okay. Um, so now that, that was added the, to the confusion. That's, that's where everybody went sideways. Okay. Sorry. Yes. And that, and that is, yes. Go ahead, Christine. If you would. So then um, when you hit no and no, um, it's again, if you hit no and yes, the other screen will pop up. If you hit no and no, um, this screen will pop up. I wish to apply for the 30 level with exemption, no training required. So it, it, it gives you an option, even if that was, even if the wrong box, so to speak, is um, selected. No okay. training required. You, you want to keep your eyes open for no training required. Next. Now comes the important part. Who are you? Um, if you use a middle name, the middle name, if you, um, this, again, the state information has to be the same. Um, it's better to not abbreviate. Uh, next slide. Uh, just try to avoid abbreviations of um, streets. On, uh, the address of the primary location can never, ever, ever be a post office box. So it needs to be the location of practice. And again, the state and the um, license have to be the same. Uh, the state of the license, the state of the practice, and the state of the DE registration for the initial waiver. After that, you can add on other DE registrations. Um, it does ask for the email address here. So a common challenge in hospitals is that credentialing departments often complete this information for people but then they put in their own email address. The approval and the official letter will go to that email address and the provider will never see it um, unless they put in their own provider address. A credentialing department can put in the prescriber's address, um, but they need to be reminded to do that. So otherwise, the um, emails will be automatically generated and they'll all be going to the credentialing person. Okay. okay. Next. Um, new notification to treat up to 30 paces. This will be auto populated by those no's and yeses that were early in. So I just wanted to let you know the first one is um, this is the screen that will pop up anyway when you put in your address. Um, new notification to treat up to 30 patients. Auto populated. Number seven, 
um, you do have to check off the box on number seven. Um, next. And this is it, uh, certification of qualifying criteria. There are multiple choices that will come up on this page, but the, the one you want is the SAM subuprenorphine practice guideline exemption. So it's the very first one and, um, and you're good to go. Next. Um, the first box will be automatically grayed out uh, for 30E applications. And uh, so sorry. Um, but the second one you will need to select certification of maximum caseload um, is auto selected also <laughs> for when you click on that you have the capacity to prescribe. Next. These are the consents to be posted on the locator, on the public facing locator information that's on the SAMHSA webpage. So you, it's your choice <laughs> whether you can want your name posted in there or not. You either have to consent or, or not consent. It must be chosen. Um, consent, do you want to be at, it's the same thing, do you, um, Check yes or, yes or no for that. Then check off the certification that it's accurate. It'll ask for, please type your name, not initials, not not number one, not the credential, well, credentialing person often does put their name. Sometimes the credentialing person puts the physician, the prescriber's name, um, but it does want your DEA number once more. And then you simply hit submit. Next. And I think something happened to slides here. Um, and if you, if you want to upload, oh. you just upload a copy of your medical license. Is that right? It would be Is helpful if you have a copy of your medical license, but we have to verify it anyway. It would be very helpful. It would save time because sometimes okay. there are challenges. But what happens here for people who are applying for a 30E is that they think that they have to apply some training, even though it doesn't call for training. And so um, it just delays it for you. It's, this, is, this whole process actually takes less than seven minutes. So, but people get jammed up with the training and we get a lot of calls from that on the help desk and a lot of emails. Um, no need to apply a, to send us a training thing. We, do, we don't need uh, your board certification that's not related. Don't worry about it if you're applying for 38. Next. So these are um, our general mailbox, the re responses from to our general, the email box is the best way to reach us. The phone is only actually accessible be, be, during regular work hours and um, most of you are very busy during regular hours. So evening hours, um, there are people responding to these all the time and um, you will get emails back at all hours. So emails best bet. The approval letters are emailed within 45 days. That's our regulatory window right now. Approvals are, are being completed within seven days. Um, there was a big jam up because we had to reprogram the whole system when the revised practice guidelines were issued. And, um, but that's okay. Um, it's working fine now and um, you should be able to get it a, a notice within a very short time. The emails will, uh, the approval letters will be auto generated within the next week or two. So um, the turnaround will be much faster than has been rumored. So that was a very quick run. Um, if you happen to have two screens and you're applying on one and you open that screen, um, if you open that slide show while you're doing it, it'll make it much faster to go through for you. And that's it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. I'm sorry really, you ran over. 
Oh, it is the devil's in the details and uh, you, you may have saved people a lot of aggravation. Um, so, uh, Christine, the recording will be shared and I know we did go through it really quickly, but we had, uh, we had the expert here showing us how to do that. Um, so please, uh, feel free to share this link with others. Um, really, really appreciate your being here, uh, navigating that website is, is a bit confusing. We appreciate your help with that. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want to thank pleasure. everyone. Sorry that we ran over, but thank you all for being uh, such an important part of addressing the opioid epidemic and the, the overdose epidemic that we're struggling with right now. You all are making a big difference by moving ahead with this ED Bridge approach. Um, feel free to be in touch. I've got my email address here, cwhartman1 at carillionclinic.org, or you can call my direct extension. 540-981-7099. Uh, we will be offering technical assistance at least through August. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. And thank you again to DMAS folks for helping us to host this WebEx webinar. Thank you, Dr. Burton. I know Dr. Wills had to sign off. Uh, Dr. Juliana, everyone that joined today. Um, Ashley, I know everyone's busy, but uh, you all are coming together to make a difference and we really appreciate it. Um, so we'll be in touch. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great weekend. <laughs>